Over 7 million different animals inhabit our planet. And I'm like, oh yeah, 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 we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And then all of a sudden we get to it and I'm like, why did we wait so long? I know, it's a good lesson. What can they teach us? Have some, some ability to predict where your prey is going. These darn wild dogs are so intelligent that, um, and I'll talk about their two types of hunting. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. This Angie, this episode is going to be amazing. I cannot believe we waited this long to cover the African wild dog or the African painted dog. I know, Chris. It's it, it is a little mind blowing. Like, what have we been doing the last year and a half? <laughs> <laughs> it's eighty species, but why did this one wait so long? I don't know. And uh, my goodness, it's been a really rich spring for us, full of at least for me, carnivore species, a tiger, and including mm-hmm. a really awesome interview coming up uh, in a couple days where I speak with an education expert from a tiger sanctuary. So please check that out. So I've been long, long and short of it is me being the hoof stock, hoof horn, it's an antlers type girl covering these carnivores, these major predators. I don't even know if I want to say this out loud, but I might be, I might be changing over here. <laughs> yeah, this is, I, the more research I did on these this week, I was like, why did we wait so long? Because so many people have been requesting this one. And I've been like, oh, yeah, 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 we'll get to it. We'll get to it. And then all of a sudden we get to it. And I'm like, why did we wait so long? I know. It's a good lesson that uh, we should yeah. listen to our audience more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. We will. We, we are. We are. Re- keep these requests coming. And if we're not listening to you, just keep coming at us. Right. Don't don't give yes. up. Don't give up. Uh, but yes, <laughs> thank you for everyone who made a suggestion for uh, the African wild dog or the African painted dog. Several names. We'll discuss that and many more amazing, mind blowing behavior. Some, oh, such cool behavior coming up that we're going to talk about today as far as a lot of other really neat physiology. So stay tuned. I, you definitely won't be disappointed. That's for sure. Yeah. And I got to give a shout out to Alexandra. Last week, she guessed it correct. Bison um, didn't give any t- hints this week because this one's just so obvious. So I, and social media, again, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook in our Facebook group. Now we're having discussions each week about the podcast and conservation, but I just, you know, what blew me away, Angie, is I didn't realize how endangered these animals were. I, I did not know that they were this endangered. Interesting, Chris. I had the same experience. And when I worked at the Lincoln Park Zoo, being a hoofstock keeper, uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo has African painted dogs currently, and they had them when I was there. And they are a beautiful species to watch. They're very active on in their exhibit and and just really f- fun animals. But I, I guess I never, I hate to admit this on air, but I never paid too much attention to them because they were carnivore. And I knew they had a conservation store and I knew that they were endangered, but I didn't know the numbers. Okay. Because right, we know right. that endangered can be anywhere from Sumatran rhino being 60 or less to, yeah. you know, 10,000 or uh, interestingly enough, the koala has now been considered not yeah. only endangered, but uh, functionally extinct. Functionally extinct. We'll, yes. We'll talk more yes. about that in our conservation news segment coming up in a, in a week or so. Uh, so join us on Patreon for that. If you'd like that, um, if you like that type of medium, but so endangered means red flag. Yes. But mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily say it says a low number, but just how low. So yeah. here I am putting this together. And of course, I'm just enamored by the behavior. And I'm just going at the behavior section. I just reading mm-hmm. article after mm-hmm. article, trying to figure it out, thinking I'm a uh, canine behaviorist, which <laughs> I'm not, but I'm learning I might want to become <laughs> yes. one. Yes, yes, yes. And then I and then I start opening up the IUCN uh, uh, website all about the African wild dog. And the number jumps out at me. Uh, I, the, my jaw hit the ground. My jaw hit the ground. I, 1,400 mature individuals. 1,400. And wait till we get to the range. That is across most of Africa. 1,400. Now, I, ha- I had a really sad, dark moment when I read that, Chris. It and was 
I know we try yeah. to keep this podcast upbeat, and I think we do a decent job at it. But mm. it was a very humbling. You and I covered how many species, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and we deal with this stuff on a week a weekly basis. But for some reason, as you said, looking at their historic range and their mm. current range, and understanding how large the African continent is, and the number being so low, and the number being fourteen hundred mature individuals, and I looked dug a little bit deeper in IUCN. Their their total population is is just under 6,700, but the 1,400 mature adults kind of had to dig a little bit in IUCN's uh, user guide. So they define mature individuals as, quote, individuals known, estimated, or inferred to be capable of reproduction. So those 1,400 are really the breeding pair. Mm -hmm. And we'll get when we get to behavior, we'll talk about pack structure and things like that. But that is still incredibly dangerously low incredibly dangerously low and it just made me very sad <laughs> there's I know, just I know. such a gorgeous beautiful creature um i know that anybody who's ever been blessed to see one in the wild which i have not um but some of my colleagues have and or study them in the wild or see them at your local accredited zoo knows just how stunning they are how unique they are and as we get into behavior and uh, you're going to learn how intelligent they are and their cooperation, some of the pack behaviors is just, just incredible. And the other thing that really struck me as gut wrenching, sorry, I promise we'll get to positive stuff. Uh, yeah, we will. There's uh, some positive news out there. But what there, struck I me was um, this, the African painted dog, or it's also sometimes just shortened as the wild dog or African wild dog has been endangered, has had really low numbers for over 20 years. And that's what kind of made me just really pause. And I know there's so many groups that are working hard and we're going to talk about that towards the end of the podcast and show you some of the, some of the hope and the, uh, the groups that are giving their lives away, their conservation heroes to save these guys. So they're out there, but it's been, it's been, uh, their numbers are still decreasing according to IUCN. And, and granted that the latest population count for mature individuals being around 1400 was in 2012, if I am correct. Mm -hmm. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's slightly it's dated, ago, yeah. uh, but the population yeah. is decreasing. And so for me, it was just a little disheart. Well, little, it was very yeah. disheartening to hear that it's still decreasing after us red flagging it, the wild dog for 20 years. Like, know, what are we doing? I, and that's... I mean, and, 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 you know, and like I said, wonderful accredited zoos like Lincoln Park zoos have them on their species survival plan and they are trying to keep mm -hmm. those genetics alive and they're doing really mm -hmm. great things to help their numbers um, for animals under human care to make this Noah's Ark genetics population uh, be maintained here in, in North America Reliable. as possible. Yeah. But and and there's tons of work being done over in Africa as well. Some groups that I'll, I'll I'll end with towards the end of the podcast. But I agree, Angie. That was kind of my feeling going into this one. It's man, I hear the violins playing. It, it it's not good. It's not good for this species. But like you said, I had to drill a little bit, and I've got some good news in here coming up uh, to share with you. Just a couple things real quick. Uh, you know, a shout out to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, we got a few more this week. And thank you for those who ordered shirts. That's amazing. Please wear them and post your photos yeah, on they're super sharp. Facebook or mm -hmm. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't wait to get mine. I know. And I was like, I, I, there is a little delay time. So it's not your typical instant gratification type of Amazon order. But I think it's better. To, good things come to those who wait, right? Yes, yes. And we're going to be doing some other things because we got requests for like, you know, water bottles and some reusable stuff. I want to find a straw company that we can work with. Yes. Uh, so, thank you to Sarah and Lindsay for mentioning some of those great ideas. We appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely going to be doing that. Um, but just real quick on Patreon, you know, the Cheetah episodes out on there. Our conservation news is out there. We've got a huge one coming in a couple of weeks that Angie and I need to plan on uh, doing our research and studying. It's a pretty popular one coming from the ocean. And again, 25% of everything we raise will go to a conservation organization of the month, which we'll be voting on in, in, in about a week. Uh, we'll post up a poll there for our supporters to, to let us know where to send the money. So thank you for that. It supports me and Angie, you know, as we try to 
keep pushing the podcast, advertising, and also getting better equipment because we're still doing this on a shoestring budget, but it's been working for a year and a half. So anyways, Angie, okay. I think a a shoestring budget is actually excessive. It's like a half a shoestring. It's like like in the negative. We're in the red a lot. No, Chris, Chris, it's it's, it's, um, uh, a twine from a bale. It's not even yes, a shoe string. It's like we have, twine. we have no budget, folks. We have none. So like please negative. help us. Thank you, Mom. If you want us to listen to us, yes, Mom, well, please keep it up. No, we're we're committed. We are committed and committed. We're going to be doing this for years to come. That we promise you. So, so yeah, Angie, we're talking about this. So we're switching gears to happy stuff. Everyone, if you're not, not yet, not yet. Oh, so I'm getting there. I'm oh, getting okay, there. Okay, I'm okay. getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. So it, it, my story, my story, you kind of laid it out nice, but it's it's really, again, third week in a row, human wildlife conflict. That's a major one for the African wild dog or African painted dog. They've had, a, this species is very sensitive to habitat fragmentation. Okay, so that is a, a big thing with with them that has that has caused their decrease. Obviously, they have conflict with you know livestock farmers and f- farmers in Africa. They you know run into snares. This is a big one: infectious disease. They are very susceptible to infectious disease from domestic dogs. Yes. So, all in all, it, it's not great news. Now, Angie, to to get to the good news. And, you know, it's a little bit different. You know, I know we we always set out our podcast to cover certain topics in order, but I thought this was just kind of important to lay out in the, in the beginning was, you know, I read this study. It's called The Demography and Dynamics of an Expanding Managed African Wild Dog Meta, Meta Population. And this was published in 2015, so not too, too long ago. And so what they did is they did a population and habitat viability assessment for wild dogs. They call it a PHVA. And this is looking specifically at South Africa. That's kind of where their their stronghold is, you know, these game parks down there. And really hit me hard in the, reading this study is, is the authors state, there's no sufficiently large contiguous patches of suitable habitat within which to establish such a population. So bottom line is they don't have the land. They don't have the land. And I know I haven't been to South Africa. I know we, you know, when I was a professor, I sent Danielle down there. You know, there is no wild in Africa. They're all managed game parks or in South Africa. You know, they're managed game parks. There's no, you know, forests or or state reserves like say here in the United States or in Canada or in South America, some of these other, other countries around the world. They are managed game parks and there just isn't much wild left in that part of Africa where to put these dogs. So that was the, really the, the challenge of this study. But, but they did look at reintroducing populations in certain areas in South Africa. And it, the news was very good that yay, they Which did for, for those of some of our, if you're a first time listener uh, and we won't go too much into the weeds today, but Canine or feline carnivore species can be notoriously difficult to reintroduce into the wild because of their exquisite and elaborate hunting skills that they need to learn, typically from being in the wild. And so there's are some wonderful success stories and here in Florida. There's a great facility that rehabilitates Florida panther. It is possible. It's just a lot harder than s- stories such as the Przewalski's horse and things like that. So that's why this is really hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. And they said, you know, some of the things they found that pup survival survival was was nearly 45%, much higher than it is in Kruger. Okay. Kruger National Park is really where the wild dogs are have a really stable, growing, expanding population from what I understand. Their, their population growth was higher. And there was, they had really assessed that the population viability was good in these areas that they reintroduced okay. them to. So that was good news. The other good news that I, that I found, this was another study. It's a little bit dated from, two, from 2005 in biological conservation. What they looked at was the impact of African wild dogs on ecotourism, specifically looking at, okay, if we bring people here to see them, specifically to see sure. African mm-hmm. painted dogs, what's the impact? And from this assessment, 
Basically, the dogs pay for themselves and generated revenue. So not only did they pay for their population management that the park had, but they made uh-huh. revenue for the park. So they were a That's benefit. what we like to hear. They were economically beneficial to that game park. So definitely people are looking at this and like you said, there is some good news in some of this. We had to weed through it and, and kind of go through the chaff, but not to be alarmist, it is a very uphill fight for them. It's, it's a huge uphill fight for them. But, yes, and- you know, again, we can do this. We can do this. We can all do this. We can, we can save this species and all these other species in peril. I know we can do it. I know we can. Right. And I think that it, especially as hopefully you stick with us in this podcast and you learn more about not only how darn cool they are, they're fun to look at. They have amazing behaviors, incredible hunting, cooperative mm. uh, behaviors, and they need us. And yeah. and there's a lot of good people working really hard for them. So the more we can educate ourselves, uh, for those of you listening are like, well, what is an African painted dog? And what does it look mm. like? And what is this? Uh, stick with us and hopefully we'll get you on um, Team African Wild Dog. Yes, for sure. they're amazing. And, and thank you to the people. Again, thank you to the people that requested this. Now, before we get to description, I know you're itching to describe them. I'm dying over here, Chris. Question. <laughs> Quick question. Can African painted dogs mate with domestic dogs and produce a hybrid? Shh, don't answer. Wait till the end of the podcast and we'll tell you. You've got me thinking. I was just like almost yeah. biting my nail trying to figure it out. So... Okay. Yeah, I'm ex- same same chromosomes, all that stuff. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll mm. fill you in. I'll fill you in. Okay, so. that's a little that's a little clue though. So that's interesting. Yeah. And yeah, I, you, you know, know people what? Pe- people have wolf hybrids as pets. Bad pet choice, but they do horrific. Have them. <laughs> well, you know what I and you know what I read um, just this morning mm-hmm. with all this Games of Thrones hype and, and the season yeah. finale, which we still need to talk about. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are getting huskies, which is a breed of dog. Mm-hmm. That's, I had one that I adopted mm-hmm. because somebody adopted it and or somebody bought it and didn't want it. So I ended up with one for years. Sinatra, he was fantastic. But boy, oh boy, was he high maintenance. Luckily, I'm a runner and a biker. And uh, we had a very active lifestyle. So we learned how to, to, uh, to be in each other's space. But because of this Game of Thrones and some of the, the whatever they are, fantasy type mm. wolf looking dog that people are getting huskies or malamutes because they kind of sort of look like the dogs Wolves, on the TV yeah. show, which they don't yeah. uh, totally. And then they get them and they realize they didn't do their homework, which mm. any, I don't care if you get a, uh, a poodle? domestic cat <laughs> or a dog or goldfish. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, you need to do your homework. Like yes. I, Chris and I have talked about it when in different bird and reptile episodes mm. about how, they're not for the faint hearted and they're not, and, and there's a lot of maintenance that comes up with each individual animal. So do your homework. And if people are not doing their homework and they're getting these huskies or malamutes that are destroying their homes because they need so much exercise and then they're dumping them. And there's, so there's an upswing of these gorgeous dogs mm-hmm. uh, in animal shelters. So yeah. I will tell you, you don't want an African wild dog as a pet. You don't. Get a beagle. I had a beagle. She was awesome. She slept most of the day. All right. So <laughs> or pug, maybe yeah, or a, just a good old mutt, right? Yeah, mutt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good old mutts are good. Go, go, go. Adopt a rescue. Okay. So the African painted dog. It's about a medium sized dog. I, I'd say a bit taller, but leaner. Right. That's how I'd kind of describe it. Yeah, it's like your average domestic dog size, but mm-hmm. longer legs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, anywhere from like 60, 70, 80 pounds, I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's pretty big. I mean, yeah, up to 75 pounds. And mm-hmm. some, su- there's, mm-hmm. we'll get to the subspecies. Some are a little bit smaller. They stand about 30 inches or 75 centimeters at the shoulder. So not quite three feet. Body length's about 40 inches or 110 centimeters. And then her tail's another 16 inches or 40 centimeters. So not huge, but not small. You know, they're not little little puppies or things like that. What makes them so unique, Angie? You look at all the pictures of them, the painted, where the painted comes from, just gorgeous, gorgeous coats. I mean, just all individual each one's individual, but you have the browns, red, blacks, yellows, white areas, just 
some striping. It's just like, again, somebody carefully painted this coat pattern on some of them. It's just, they're drop dead gorgeous with huge ears, by the way. <laughs> Enormous. They have huge rounded ears. <laughs> Mickey Mouse just... ears. Yeah, Mickey Mouse ears. Absolutely. <laughs> huge Mickey Mouse, like, uh, Frisbees. Yeah. <laughs> most, yeah. if you will. Uh, but yes, their coats are just gorgeous and no two wild dogs are marked exactly the same. So it's almost like a fingerprint as far as their markings go. And it's just colorful. It's a patchy coat, mm -hmm. bushy tail, usually a white tip at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're not familiar with one and you're not driving, I highly recommend you either go over to our show notes or use the good old Google image mm -hmm. to pull up a picture of it. So the rest of the podcast, you can have a visual of just how beautiful and stunning of canine they are. Yeah. Yeah. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. And we mentioned it earlier, you know, you're talking about the range and this is what really, again, hit me kind of hard because their habitual range was pretty much most of the lower two thirds of Africa. Again, sure. you mm -hmm. take out the Sahara desert, you know, they really weren't too much of a desert dwelling dog. You take out the Congo that the, really the, the heart of Africa. The wet forest. Right. Yeah. But everywhere else, all over East Africa, down through Central, all the way down to the, to the, the Horn. Sub-Sahara Africa. Yeah. yeah. They were everywhere. And then today, there's just dots in that range of where they're found. It's, and, and, they, right. and they're still in West Africa. They're still in Central Africa. They're still in East and South Africa, but they're just little, little dots everywhere. So mm -hmm. they're completely fragmented, completely disrupted, and it, it's horrific. You look at the range and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it, there's no, like I said, there's some strongholds in Botswana and South Africa, but. And uh, there's and, uh, some of the, the bigger populations are in uh, Tanzania and Northern Ma Mozambique too. So they're, they're, there's, but they're, as you mentioned, that's very, those are huge, huge countries yes. in Africa. Yes. Yes. So saying, oh, well, there's some in Tanzania and some in uh, uh, well, South here, Africa here. is saying, here. is saying like yeah. there's some. No, no. As I say here, I have the populations. I, I actually took IUCN's population and took the, the metadata. Mm -hmm. So here you go, Angie, West Africa. Okay. In Senegal and Burkina Fosa, Niger, there's a subtotal of 70 animals in West Africa, 70 African painted dogs. Then you go to Central Africa. So you're talking Sudan, Chad, Central Africa Republic. There's 291 total animals in those in that region of the world. 291. I guarantee you in the city I am today, there's close to that in, in one uh, rescue center here in California. There's probably 300 Obviously, animals yeah. you know, in there. Mm. Now we go to Eastern Africa. Okay, total 3,700. But you were talking about Tanzania. You know, you're looking at six, uh, let me add this up, 11, 1,200 in Tanzania. You're looking at- Which is like, these are huge countries. Yeah, 300 in Kenya. So, well, more than that. There's probably 500, 600 in Kenya, but not much. And then you go to South Africa and there's, and there's 2,600 roughly uh, total animals in South Africa, Mozambique, and Zambia. You know, does everyone want and Zambia? Now, yeah, you went to Zambia, right? Yeah, I've yeah. been uh, I've been blessed. Uh, yeah. Zambia is a really amazing country yeah. in uh, southern, central, central southern Africa. I spent a little time in Tanzania doing mm. some wildebeest research, and then I've spent time in South Africa, but not in Kruger yet. I, know, I have a potential there. trip in October coming up, mm -hmm. but I have been to Cape Town. So yeah. I haven't done much wildlife in South Africa yet, but hopefully... Hopefully I'll be podcasting from Cape Town in October. Yeah. If I'm lucky. Yeah. Or at least at least posting really cool pictures to our Instagram. Page. I'm gonna be so jealous. I'm, <laughs> right. I'm gonna hide your luggage. I'm gonna be hiding in your luggage while you travel <laughs> down there. <laughs> Please do. Yes. It's gonna be awesome. Yes. I'm still I got a trip to Tasmania coming up. I'm gonna go. It's look. not hundred percent sure yet, yeah. but I feel like if I put it on air, if I put if I plant that yeah, seed, it's then manifest it. Will, manifest it. Fruition. I will be going to Tasmania this summer, I think. I'm pretty sure we're going. And I will be looking for the Tasmanian. Angie? Kangaroo. No. I'm just teasing. Tiger, remember? I'm devil. So, no, oh, no, yes. no. I'm looking for t I, I, devils That's are there. Right. I thought I thought we were talking about the devil and you were you were you were you were somewhere 
somewhere <laughs> off in La La Land. I will find, on a Chris tangent. I will I don't find even know that tiger somewhere, it, and I'll prove to you that they still exist. <laughs> They've been extinct for so 100, 100 years. Oh, uh, that one was. I forgot what episode that was. I went off, but that was that was hilarious. Anyways, yeah, I'm hopefully go see some Tassie Devils down there. Yeah, and talking about their their distribution. So there's really five subspecies. There's the Cape Wild Dog, the East African Wild Dog, West African Wild Dog, Chad Wild Dog, and the Somali, Somali Wild Dog. So those are the the five subspecies of them. And then, so how are what are those numbers like? I mean, how how do those numbers line up with this? Total of fourteen hundred mature individuals, or six thousand. Well, potential. yeah, I mean the total. So total. the West African is is critically critically endangered. You're talking what did we say less than seventy. The the Chad was a few hundred. The Somali was a few hundred. Your really two yeah. major populations okay. are the Cape wild dog and the East African wild dog. The, those are your two strongholds. Okay. Yeah. So those those gotcha. those three smaller subspecies are definitely heading towards extinction quickly. You know, it's really the, the research, the money, the ecotourism is all in East and South Africa, right? Because nobody's going to Chad to go look at wild dogs, you know, in some of these, gotcha. these areas of the, of the, maybe they are, I don't know, correct us if I'm wrong. I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just looking at some of the areas like Sudan and, and Ethiopia and Chad where there's you know, some of these problems, you know, I don't see people running there to, to see wild dogs, you know? Sure. For ecotourism. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and bless the people that are out there doing the research on them, you know, oh my goodness, right. they are you know risking their lives in that part of the world. Conservation heroes. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot to care about these animals. I, you know, if you've been listening to us for the past month or a few episodes talking about these carnivores, I mean, here you have another major carnivore that is critical to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. I mean, we cannot talk about this enough that you need control. These herbivores, I'm sorry, zebras and wildebeest and all these other things need something to hunt them to, you know, meet out or weed out the sick and injured and the less genetically viable. It's not only important for say the grasslands or the plant species and all that stuff, but it's, it's important for their population. Well, and Chris talking about the whole ecosystem in a major predator, like a wild dog, there was that video going around not too long ago about what happens to the ecosystem in North America when wolves return. Because here in North America, we've had our own human wildlife conflict, of course, with wolves, be it red wolves or um, gray wolves and things like that. And so, but studies have shown that have assessed total ecosystem roles from soil to grasses to herbivores, such as deer and elk, to, of course, the carnivores. And that when, when wolves were reintroduced to the landscape, to the ecosystem, it changes everything including the way that the streams flow. Did you see that video, Chris? I no, think we've talked about this on the we've podcast We've talked about before. it because I've known about it and, and I've read the study. So we will definitely, I, I will hunt that link down and I will provide, I'll start, actually start blasting it on social media because, you know, Julie, our friend down in Florida requested that we talked about that and we will. Yeah. And I don't think, I, I don't want to speak out of turn because there is a fair amount of, of course, research and uh, people fighting for the wild dogs and trying to learn more about the behavior to figure out how much land they need to live in and what their social dynamics are and all these really, really cool and important things. I don't know if they've been able to do some cool time elapsed video mm -hmm. <laughs> that shows just how critical these predators uh, are to the ecosystem, but I would imagine it's something similar, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, that they can literally change right. landscapes because of their important role. And you don't think about the fungus in the soil or this flow of a mm -hmm. river when you think about a carnivore, mm -hmm. but you yeah. should. And I think studies are showing just how important they are. And I think from a human perspective, we're learning more and more about how our own ecosystem is important. It's not just about the human. It's, we are, I mean, to me, it's fascinating. We have more foreign DNA um, 
in and on our bodies than we do our own DNA. Mm. We have our own little ecosystem going on, <laughs> People right? People don't want to know that. They don't want to know that, Angie. They don't want to know about the, really? the little bugs in their eyelids. They don't want to know. Isn't that funny? <laughs> because, you, you know, you actually bring up a good point because I, I have a new class starting yeah. right now for a summertime. And I, and I mentioned that and they all just, I don't want to say they rolled their eyes at me because they weren't rude or anything. But I thought you were crazy. I guess you. Were, I, I thought. I, yeah, they thought yeah. I was crazy. They think yeah. I'm crazy. They love me. They love me, but they also are like, "Lady, quit talking about your birth. Like we don't want to hear about it." No, I'm not that bad. <laughs> but uh, or your yeah. kids or or animals, yeah. right? Because uh, no. Um. But no. Um. I think that's a really fun fact. But I'm also a super science yes. dork. Yes. So, but 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 the point of the point is whether you think that's fascinating or not. Studies in humans are just showing how, and when you we look at an eco, the way that I think about an ecosystem, Chris, is I think about the really small mm-hmm. single cellular mm-hmm. organisms, the amoebas, mm-hmm. paramecium's, right? Go back to high school biology, and then I think about the yeah. elephants. So really, really small and really, really big, and they have important interactions that we don't Angie, even know about. Angie, the, the universe is is really operating with you and I right now because it's funny you say that. I posted an Instagram video uh, just last week and it was Global Conservation Wildlife, our, our, one of our favorite organizations. Yeah, Dr. Doc, Dr. Yeah, Barney Long. And, thank you, my friend. Got to get yes, back. Yes, I know. Love and, that guy. Uh, Dr. Robin Moore, you know, with the... Uh, he is yeah. phenomenal and he's a he is fun to follow on yeah. Facebook Obviously, before his for his amazing amphibian right. conservation work, but also because he's an am- awesome photographer. Yeah. yeah. So follow him on Instagram too. His, he, I follow him on Instagram. Yes, yeah. his photos are stunning of wildlife. So I post. They posted. They asked, "What does biodiversity mean to you?" In one word, hmm. which was very difficult to think about. And I posted, I think, wholeness. You know what, what you were talking about. So I went and shot a video after thinking about that. And I went and did a little nature trail walk and I thought, what does biodiversity mean to me? And then I hit record and I just recorded my thoughts. And basically, you know, what I was talking about was from the soil up into the air and from the top down, everything in between. Mm-hmm. It's not just the elephants. And I said elephants, gorillas, bison, some of these other species we've covered, even though they're critical as umbrella species. And here we are going on a tangent, but it's important. I know it's so early in the pod and here we go. Sorry, listeners. (laughs) But it is true. Biodiversity just isn't the one single megafauna. It is everything in between and the plants and the microbes and the insects and all of that. The soil. So maybe I'll put Mm -hmm. a link on the the biodiversity too, just if people want to watch that and just get an idea, you know, what they were talking about and what biodiversity kind of means. Because here you are, a major carnivore, that when you remove them from this ecosystem, we know we have scientific data, facts that support their importance to the ecosystem. Just critical. Yeah. yeah. Critical. I know. I'm trying to think of what my one word would be. That's really tough. Uh, for biodiversity, my one word. Hmm. Maybe connectedness. Okay. Connectedness. There you go. Okay, go post it. Go or post it on Instagram. Pathways or... <laughs> cycles. I don't know. <laughs> Three Anyways. hours later. That's it. And I, <laughs> that's it. you're going to call me. I found it. <laughs> you're going to go to bed thinking about it. I'll wake up. I'll wake up at like four in the morning and be like, Oh, I, I know my okay. perfect word. Post it, post it, post it. <laughs> All right. So let's jump to evolution because we, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. you know, we, the red wolf one way back when, and Hey, you know, say hi to autumn out there in the Carolinas. Autumn. Love mm-hmm. you. Thank you. We need to have another conversation yes, soon. Yes. So. Out there fighting Thank for you. the red wolves. In that part of the world, we said, you know, we'd save uh, ev- dog evolution for another day. So here's here's part of it. And I know we're going to get to gray wolves okay. in, in soon, too. So, you know, we can cover some more of this. But now the African wild or painted dog scientific Latin name isn't Canis. You know, Canis lupus is wolf or gray wolf. And then Canis lupus familiaris is domestic dog. The right. African wild dogs is Lycaon pictus and it means painted wolf yeah that really threw yeah. me out good job pronouncing like yeah, i Lycan. i was i was not very good at that <laughs> but yeah where does that come from is that that's how different yeah they that's are. their genus yeah so they're totally mm-hmm. different genus than wolves and and i'll tell their story here in a minute you know how they 
Oh, I'm sure you will, Chris. <laughs> get your get your coffee. I'm actually going to sit back and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, kick your feet up. Let me let me crack open another okay. Lacroix. Here we go, another four hour podcast. No, no, I, I, you know, distinct. Here we go. So again, we've said the myocids. The myocids gave rise to the carnivores. You know, you're talking Ursidae, mustelids, our favorite. We got to do another mustelid soon. Honey badger, all of them. Pinnipeds. Okay, we know that. Now, canids evolved. In North America, 35 million years ago. Okay, that's when the first instance of really a a canid type carnivore existed. Now, for the next 30 million years, they hung out here, Angie. They were all over the place, you know, hung out in North America. It was about seven to eight million years ago. They finally moved into Asia over the Bering Strait, okay, the land bridge. So then they went and just proliferated and then went down into Africa. All right, 3 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama came out of the sea. As sea levels dropped, that Isthmus came up, and then they went into South America. Okay? Here's a cool fact okay. and for our friends. Ooh, I love facts. Yeah, our friends down in Australia. You know, good day, Lee Hello, and all friends. our friends. We've got, a, we've got a bunch of mm-hmm. them down there. From Perth to Sydney, we have friends in Australia. It's amazing. So the dingo, which we'll cover next year or so, I, I guarantee we'll cover them too. They came to Australia about 10,000 years ago with humans. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yes. They were, they were a quote unquote domesticated species that came over with humans. And then they. Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> now, the wolf and wild dog had a common ancestor about 3 million years ago. Okay. Okay. But then the genus Lycaon first appeared about 1.5 million years ago you know, now is the the only free living species and it's only found in Africa, the African painted dog. So you look at, there's over 38 species of in in canids, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Tons of them. You got the wolves, the jackals, you know, foxes, the African wild dog closest relative. Can you guess we were going to cover them, but we switched. (laughs) The dull. Yeah. 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 So they were about, 2.7 2.7 million. I only years know ago. that because I recommended the dole. Okay. Yeah. That's we were, you. I can't just... <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. It's really cool. Oh, you got to find a researcher. Here's one I, pr- sure. I promise you. In the next 10, we're going to be doing the fennec fox. I'm going to insist we do the fennec fox. <laughs> I love that you're insisting in that because I just saw one at the National Zoo and uh, we had him at Lincoln Park Zoo. I, of course, yes. I didn't work with him as I was not yeah. a small mammal or carnivore keeper. I was a small mammal keeper, but they yeah. weren't the small mammals that I worked with. Ah, I refell in love. I'm like Fennec Fox. Where have you been my whole life? I know I love you. they're so cute. Oh, but there's so many of the foxes, the Arctic fox. There's so many species, Angie. We're going to be in business for the next How do 50 we pick? years. Maybe, th- maybe that's what we should. Um, we could pull our listeners to pick yeah. their favorite fox species. Patreon and we can show pictures. Our pat- Patreon. Our Patreon. We'll, yeah. Our Patreon mm-hmm. folks. You pick. I like you, that. We'll put it up. It, we'll put- I, I don't. It is. It is such a tough decision which one we cover first because they're so. And they're so cute. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so African wild dog, not a ton of fossil evidence. There, there just isn't a ton. Now, a recent discovery did find a relative of African wild dog in South Africa, and it dates about two million years ago. Okay, okay. so that's when they know they 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 were there. But the oldest fossil of today's African wild dog dates back two hundred thousand years ago, and they found it in Israel. Okay, wow. right there in the middle. Oh, East. wow. Okay. So we know they've been around for at least 200,000 years, if not more. Okay. And again, down to 6,700 animals left, which is really sad. All right. Really quickly, domestication. And, and, and again, we'll save this story. Maybe we get to wolves. But the earliest fossil evidence of domestic dogs dates about 12 to 14,000 years ago in Western Eurasia. Mm-hmm. Some DNA evidence suggests that dogs actually arose in East Asia around 15,000 years ago, or some have him even as long as a hundred thousand years ago, wolves slash dogs were hanging out with humans. So yeah, it's man's oldest friend. I would say in the animal kingdom is the dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you said game of Thrones. So (laughs) largest bringing it home folks, bringing, he's making it relatable. Yes. Largest canid ever, Angie. Game of Thrones. What do you think? The dire wolf. No. <laughs> you would think it's close, though. It's close. The dire wolf was close, 
but there was one that was a little bit bigger. So the largest canid ever was Epsion. Wait, the dire wolf is not a real species. Yes. For the record. Yeah, it was. You go to the Natural History Museum. Yes. Okay. I thought it was They're all fantasy, Florida. like dragons. No, they were just making no. stuff up. <laughs> dragons are, are real? Sure? You... Dragons are real. Please. Do you not know dragons? Oh, come on. Where is the one <laughs> place in the world where you can see a dragon today? Besides Westeros. Komodo dragon. And we and I there saw one uh, in, yeah. animal, in Orlando at uh, Animal Kingdom. And they, yes. are, they are in the top 10 on my list. The dire wolf actually went extinct when all the megafauna went extinct about 10,000 years ago. When we had the, the end of the Ice Age. So okay. they did go extinct. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. Eps- I cannot yeah. wait to get done with this podcast. So I can, I mean, not really joking. <laughs> so I can go ask John because I don't know. He might not know that. This is why this okay. podcast is so much fun. Yes. It's amazing to talk about yeah. real animals. And I just learned that dire wolf is a real animal. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. It is. A, it's a, it is a real. And there are dragons in Komodo Island. <laughs> so we will <laughs> cover that. Touche. Yes. All right, so Epsion was about five feet long, one and a half meters, 38 inches at the shoulder, and estimated weight 136 kilograms, died out in North America about 5 million years ago. Boom. Done. Evolution in a nutshell. Wow. We will cover more in a future pod on canids because they are so amazing. They are so fascinating. It oh. is. There's a lot of diversity, right? And just God, and, it is. and so cool. And we even talked about, like, I want to talk about the domesticated fox study where they, you know, 50 generations and now they have a domesticated fox. It's a study they've been doing in Russia for 60 years. I think you've talked um, about it on the pod before, but okay. I don't know. Where. Yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing study. It is very cool. All right. So African wild dogs live about 10 years. And the only cool physiology I found is they lack dew claws on its front legs. That's right. It. So they <laughs> basically have four instead of five. Is that? Yeah. Numerically, yeah, so they don't have correct. that little floaty, floaty fingernail that you sometimes have to remove from your domestic dogs. Yeah, it's, or it's just a pain in the keister to clip. I always forget about yeah. that one when I'm trimming nails. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it doesn't get caught on things and rip, mm-hmm. rip the Hook, toenail. Hooked on stuff. Yeah. Now, what kills African wild dogs besides humans? Obviously, uh, occasionally lions will. The young do get picked off by other number of predators. Your hyenas, your leopards. You know, so you know, pup survival rates not the greatest. What is amazing, Angie, and I cannot wait to get to behavior. That's why I'm kind of getting through this stuff quickly, is their hunting. And I remember it was Planet Earth, I believe it was, was the first one that, I don't know if it wasn't drones because I didn't have drones 10 years ago like we do today. But they filmed overhead of a pack hunting and mm-hmm. it just, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there in a second. Okay. So they tend to prey on animals that are about twice their weight. I right? found that really fascinating. And yeah. Like, yeah. think about that for a second, right? Yeah. Twice their weight. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, lion, I mean, lions take down Cape Buffalo sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, it's not always easy for them, but yeah, you know, they, they do. They're tenacious, you know, and they, they Impala, some bush dikers, some wildebeest or zebras, if they're hurt or injured, they can take down or like, you know, maybe some small zebras. I did find some data in East Africa. Thompson's gazelles made up 54, 54% of their hunts. Uh, newborn wildebeest or juvenile wildebeest was 36%. Grant's gazelles were 8%. Now, this one I do not know. You tell me. Kongani. What did you say about dire wolves? <laughs> so Kongani is about 2%. I clearly and- I don't know what that is. I don't either. Uh, this is, I don't know, the study. We, and need, then, we um, need to hire somebody to Google stuff for us. All right. On command Googling. <laughs> yeah, let's move on so we don't sound stupid. So this is, okay. Here is an amazing fact I didn't realize. Oh, I can't, Chris. Cash- I can't. That's, you got to look at Kangani. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's <laughs> part it of being subtly type A. I'm not, I'm not hard, hardcore type a, a, but I definitely have some tendencies. Yeah. Will the beast. It's a wildebeest? Well, it's a wildebeest what also kind of called wildebeest? new. Yeah, I guess it's just a. Uh, yeah, it's maybe a different name for it. Okay. Okay. Wildebeest 2%. Well, it's the genus name. <laughs> okay. Supposedly. Okay. So there Allegedly. you go. It's, it's you know, there are, there are a bunch of subspecies. I do know there. what a wildebeest right, so is. I promise. Yes, I we do. Even went on a little you, you study. You said you studied them. I hope you do. Yeah. 
<laughs> I never heard that term, so that must be a an archaic term. Okay. Wait, that's not a wildebeest? What? The thing with stripes isn't a wildebeest? What? <laughs> it's like, okay. So they're pretty successful too, by the way. About 60% of their hunts are successful because they're tenacious. I read up to 80%, yeah. but of course, yeah. different studies have 80. different yeah. numbers, but yes. Mm-hmm. They're tenacious. They, they just, they run them Well, the that's ground. actually about 30% higher uh, than the success, hunting success rate of a lion. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now this is, again, this is what I, I, I really thought was interesting. Sometimes these larger kills, they will cache them, but they don't go back mm-hmm. and eat it. They don't eat carrion. They don't eat any, it doesn't matter how fresh the kill is, they won't go back and eat it. After they get their initial fill, they're done, which is weird because most other predators, it's like, no, I got to eat. I'm going to eat this. They've got a little bit of class. Yeah. Yeah. We like them. We yeah. like them. All right, Ange. This is what I've well, been I, Well, I mean, you, you rolled into it perfectly. I, I think yeah. the first and most important thing to talk about with their behavior is their hunting. That's uh, super impressive. Uh, at, as Chris and I mentioned, with a successful effective hunting rate of between 60 and 80%, that's pretty incredible. Uh, how do they do it? And I'm going to be able to answer some of that question. And mm-hmm. just like a good researcher that I am, uh, I answered a few questions that I had, but I think I got, I think I was left in the literature actually having more questions. Always. So what I, what I can share with our listeners is that wild dogs, African wild dogs or painted dogs are cooperative hunters. So what does cooperative mean? Well, what it sounds like, it's the highest level of, co- it's collaboration. And cooperative implies for if you're a strict behaviorist that basically individuals in a group take on different roles during a hunt. What does that mean? Well, for some of you sports fanatics out there with your <laughs> soccer and football and field hockey and things mm. like that, uh, that means there's blockers and there's drivers And what does that mean? Well, that means there's individuals that are doing, that are targeting the prey, which what are we going to pick, right? Communicating that to other dogs. And then there's blockers and can be drivers and some remain stationary. Some go for the chase. It is just coordination at its highest level. And of course there's different level, depending on from the expert point of view, which I am not, uh, when it comes to this type of behavior, but especially because I study mostly ungulates, but Mm -hmm. from a carnivore perspective with this cooperation, there's different levels of coordination. And, but in general, it implies that these dogs have to keep their attention, their directed attention on their prey. And then, if you can think about this, because we've all seen the cheetah chasing the gazelle, right, in slow motion, and it's just, and we covered cheetahs in Patreon, so check that out. I think it's a fabulous episode. The behavior is incredible uh, and funny. Some of it's kind of funny. Uh, but we watch it, and that gazelle scoots left, and the cheetah can turn and angle with it. Well, in cooperative hunting, it basically implies that as a group, you all have to reverse trajectories, uh, make changes in speeds and gates and have some some ability to predict where your prey is going. These darn wild dogs are so intelligent that, um, and I'll talk about their two types of hunting, but not only uh, do they, can they kind of predict which way the prey is gonna, going to go. One of their hunt, they have two main, I'll just jump into it. They have two main hunting styles. One of them is to outrun the prey. Yeah, That's they go they forever. They, they they run marathons. Yeah. These high chase speeds can cover an incredible ground. Like if you picture the dogs chasing after a gazelle or an impala, and they can run up speeds up to 55 kilometers per hour at maximum. And they have two styles. They have this long distance marathon not marathons, it's super exaggerated, but they have this long distance chase where they basically end up beating the prey and stan- stamina, outrun it. And then another hunting tactic that they do is they will drive their prey towards rivers, lakes, and other bodies of water. 
And so basically most animals understand that the water in Africa is mm, deep and there's crocodiles and just other things you don't want to go into it. So when an animal's chased towards the water, it might be brave enough to dive in, but more likely it'll panic and turn back. And there it turns around to basically a block mm-hmm. to its to its uh to the to the wild dogs. So they're able to coordinate all that and I don't how? understand how. Yeah, how? I, like, John I mean, and I just, were such dorks. We yeah. we uh, traveled this past weekend. We got to go to the National Zoo. Mm-hmm. Highly, highly, highly recommended. Yeah, it's a great zoo. The National Zoo is amazing. I only got to spend six hours there. It was not enough. Uh, but on the airplane home, people probably thought we were super dorks. But I kept <laughs> trying to talk to I, Well, I kept trying to find the answer to this question, Chris. Yeah. And he kept trying to be like, oh, well, it's probably this or that. And I'm like, no, no, no. I want a real answer. And I mm-hmm. had a hard time in the literature finding exactly – I, I think researchers don't know, how do they communicate that with one another? And what researchers do know is that a lot of the cooperative hunting is led or initiated by the alpha male. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, pack um, hierarchical structures here in a second. But he he leads it, and so maybe he selects the prey. I don't really understand how all this is communicated whether it's the blocking or the chasing, I, the driving, you know, all just this. Just to dork out for a second. I know you and John were on an airplane trying to figure this out. Yes, but Chris, all of these, all of these choices and changes in trajectory and mm-hmm. all of this is happening, especially if they're going not necessarily for the river chasing them into the water body, right. but when they're going on the wear them out trek, the stamina yeah. trek, this is happening at speeds up to 55 kilometers per hour, which is what miles per hour, like 37, 30 something, 40 something. So let me, so this is what I remember distinctly that I was telling you about just a few minutes ago. The, the, this planet earth, I'll, I will find the clip. I will find the clip of them hunting and I will post this. I, I, I will, cause I want to watch it again, but I see it directly in my head. The packs in single file and you have dogs oh, peel off to you the left. Oh, you didn't let me wait. Right. You, you didn't oh. wait for it, Chris. Well, they go. Okay, go, 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 go. Sorry. Yeah, just, I saw that in my head and I'm like, I'm listening. I'm no, following you. No, it's true. So, and I'm watching this And I should happen. let you describe it because you're, you're, you're way more, I, I kind of like your analogy and you've got to find that clip because what Chris is describing is their second style of hunting when they try to do, when they try to out chase prey, which they're very, they wear them out. The way that they do this is they'll chase it for several kilometers, okay, long distances. And they act like an Olympic cycling team. Now, I'm not an Olympic cyclist, but I do like to do some endurance bike races, 40 kilometers, things like that. And and I shouldn't say races. I should say like participations. I don't race. I participate for if it's like for breast cancer or whatever. Uh, And But I've seen the really amazing, awesome bike riders with all the gear and all this stuff. And... These dogs act like an Olympic cycling team in that the dog at the head of the chase, they run in a line, in a line behind each other. And the dog at the head, when it knows it starts to get tired, somehow it knows this and it just drops back and falls to the end of the line. And so this, the one that was number two knows that it's its turn to push and lead the pack. And it does this for I don't know how long, but basically until it gets tired and so on and so forth, basically until the prey succumbs to exhaustion. The dogs don't get exhausted because they have this really cool Olympic, these endurance riders do it to uh, travel, of course, these long distances when they're in a race together. So can I ask you? you Teamwork, man. Crazy teamwork. It is. It is. Can I ask you, so, so you can dork out for a second, would they have My more pleasure. slow twitch or fast twitch muscles? Reinforce some learning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, well, they go, they're going fast. If they're going 55 kilometers yeah. per hour, but it, the endurance is going to be more slow yeah. twitch. Yeah. So they have amazing ability. That's what I yeah. am. I'm a slow twitcher. Yeah, we talked about that. We geeked out on muscles for a while. And I'm a fast yes. twitcher, or I used to be a fast twitcher. <laughs> I don't know if it's sprinting. I'm doing that. Should later. be our hashtags. I'm a slow twitcher. I'm a slow twitcher. Well, we know you're. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, we're not going we just twitcher is not a real scientific word, people. Yeah. For the record, it's fast twitch or slow. T- I can't even say it now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, they, 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 they have incredible yeah. endurance. So physiology, there we go. You know, you and I were kind of struggling their dogs, you know, what kind of physiology do they have that that's unique? That is one of them that they can just go forever. And so you look at the dogs that do the I did rod and some of these other things, they just can go for a long time. So their physiology is incredible from an endurance perspective. Absolutely hands down. But I, because we've talked a little bit about endurance and deep, just really cool physiology things, but I kind of wanted to really dork out on the behavior aspect, the intelligence. How highly intelligent, we all know our dog. If you have a dog at home, I'm sure, please tell me if you don't think your dog's smart. I, I, I would be, I think we'd be hard pressed to find somebody. So it's not surprising that they're very smart, but that's where I wanted to take it to a new level of how are they doing? How are they saying, Hey, you're the blocker. Hey, you're the driver. Hey, you, you push them. I, I'm, or I'm going to lead the, I'm going to lead the, I'm, you know, I'm going to lead the, the front of the bike. Are they doing it through visual cues? Are they doing it through audio cues? Are they doing it through, like innate physiology, like you're just born to be a blocker or a driver, or are they doing it through practice and trial and error? That's kind of what John, his hypothesis was. Are I And mine was like, I feel like they're doing it through some visual facial cues or something, but if they're moving that fast, that's probably totally wrong. Now that I say it loud, it doesn't really make no. sense. I don't know. And granted, because I was on a fun-filled Kid free weekend yeah. for the first time in six years with my husband. <laughs> I uh, I dove into some literature, but I I couldn't find the answer I was looking for. So if we have anybody who's studied uh, African wild dogs or knows the answer to this, I just don't know how they communicate that with each other. And it, but to me, it just screams intelligence. Right. We need to find a researcher and reach out to them. And Chris, to talk about their intelligence and their adaptability. I found a really interesting and or potentially hopeful study um, in Nature uh, Communications uh, Scientific Journal from 2006 from Hubble and co-workers. And it, the title is Additive Opportunistic Capture Explains Group Hunting Behavior in African Wild Dogs. And what they were doing is, as Chris mentioned earlier in the pod, there are these fragmented populations. And Albeit most wild dogs live in savanna or savanna woodlands, they're classified or desert woodland or desert savanna ish areas. There are some fragmented populations that lived in mixed woodland savannas. And it appears, I don't know if they've been more pushed into that area because of human interference or uh, they couldn't be in the normal savanna where they'd like to be. So they've had been in more of this woodland area. I'm not sure exactly how they're found more in the woods than they are in the savanna. But in this population, they don't have those flat, long, big surfaces to chase an animal for, for a couple kilometers. So researchers using all this high GPS technology and just really amazing, cool things. So researchers using uh, cool technologies like GPS, high resolution, and all this other fancy stuff, basically we're looking at um, a pack of African wild dogs in Botswana. And what they found, instead of these chasing them into a body of water or wearing them out to exhaustion, they, interestingly enough, found that that's not what they saw in the woodlands. They actually did multiple short distance hunting attempts. Interestingly enough, instead of those high kill rates or successful rates that we talked about earlier in their pod being 60 to 80%, these researchers found that they had a really not great uh, kill rate of 15.5%, but they were more cooperative, cooperative in sharing prey. We'll talk about that too in behavior, but they were better at sharing when they did get it and that they, because they were more opportunistic and had these, uh, they had a lot more opportunities because they're they were doing these short bouts through the woods. Well, and you think, and what it, and I'm just gonna say real quick, oh, just to kind of, yeah, as you're talking about that woodlands, right? More trees. You don't have these open savannas where you can chase or flush something out. 
they can go right, left. They interfere, lose sight. As you're talking, I'm thinking, and I know you'll probably get to vocalizations here in a second, but is it could be just a quick, you know, bark or something to indicate, but that gets lost in woodlands, you know, like sound bounces different weird ways. So to go from a 60 Well, and you have big trees yeah. in your in your visual plane, like if you are looking at a blocker or a yeah. flusher or something. And they're and low to the so, ground, by the way. But, they're low to the ground, right? So they're they're two, mm-hmm, three feet up mm-hmm. off the ground. Yeah. But the researchers are are hopeful for a couple reasons. Yeah. They don't love the low kill rate, but what they love is the ad- adaptability because it shows that they could maybe live in different types of areas. So if we have to reserve them in this area versus that, it might be okay. And these short distance um, chases potentially have benefit for not draining them full of energy. And they seem to be sharing their prey better when they do have this. So they can have more, their success rate might be not great, but they can have more bouts of it because it doesn't expend as much energy. So, it's just really fascinating, and I, I don't think if researchers know if this is a new strategy due to They're adapting yeah. habitat change and fragmentation. But regardless, it's interesting to know that they are much more adaptive and cooperative than anybody else. And it's thought. that's the that's and that's the thing: cooperative intelligence. So you think about a pack, and you're you know pack dynamics, but it just blows me away. How they do this? It blo- uh, right. So I don't have the answer for you, listeners. No. And it sounds like Chris doesn't. No, either. it needs more. Re- we need more research. And I, mean, I want to explore you know, it more, yeah. and we'll continue to cover species. Right. Uh, I I really would like to do um, more wolves right. and other other cooperative hunters because it is. I I had this weird. Oh my gosh! Should I go down the wrong path yeah. and yeah. study ungulates? Like <laughs> I really love this, and I've uh, wolves were always one of my favorites when I was growing up. Probably before I started riding horses, so it was uh it was this was channeling some of my inner inner wolf Angie spirit. So we will we're gonna we're gonna keep keep on this topic. But if any 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 experts out there that know this or are people that have just observed it, uh, please feel free to chime in and help us out. And I'm gonna keep diving in the literature because I'm fascinated by it. But I think it's safe to basically say, in general, African wild dogs are gregarious animals. That means they're very social, and they can form packs of up to 40 members. And now with a population decline, packs have decreased on average to about 7 to 15 members. And a pack is going to have an alpha male and an alpha female, which are a dominant breeding pair that are monogamous. Mm -hmm. So they breed for yes. life. I choose you, you choose me. We're married. Yep. Till death yep. do us part, right? And then then after that, there's definitely do- dominance hierarchies for the males and the females. And a pack will typically have more males than females. And females have much higher rates of immigration from their natal group, mm-hmm. so from where they were from where they are born to going to a different group. Than I mean, males. just think of that behavior real males. quick. Think of that behavior real quick. That's why behavior you, mm-hmm. you started me on this behavior stuff years ago. I love that. You oh, love it so it's much. So am- animal behavior. You made me love repro yeah. though. Right. Yeah. So it, the know. science of it. Yes. It's all fair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the, <Touché. laughs> the, the behavior <laughs> is insane. Animal behavior is the coolest science out there i want to go back and redo my phd word <laughs> yeah. yes i want to go study I love it i want to go study wild dogs i want to go study pinnipeds i want to go study whales i but it's i want to study insects i mean what yeah the, what the, what, i mean right? the intelligence Crazy. level it's you know and I, and I posted something on instagram the other day like a, a picture of a, a bison mom and baby and i put can animals feel you know and it got some good discussion out there and, and it's a it's a topic near and dear to my heart because yes, animals can absolutely feel. They feel fear, they feel love, cooperation, things like that. Attachment, and again, it's going to vary by you know the, the species as you go up and down the, the tree of life. But gosh, the intelligence, like so, so females, okay, think about these. These females leave the pack to go either form another pack or be adopted by someone else. Think about that for a minute. That is where you get the genetic diversity. That's why it's viable. If they didn't ever leave, 
you know, you have brothers and sisters mm-hmm. taking over and they're all, you know, Related. yeah. Mm-hmm. Whoa. I just, uh, yeah. behavior is amazing. It is so cool. And so, yeah, the females will leave the pack usually around two and a half years or older to, and they, they find usually they're smart. They find uh, packs that have no adult females where they know they can, like you said, pass your genes yeah, along. Amazing. Now about half of young males will stay with their father's pack and then the rest will leave to form a new pack. And within this pack, Chris, so we've talked about the hunting. We tried to figure some of it out. I think we talked in circles. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> it's really cool and crazy that they do it and they do it well. Um, but within the pack, they have really unique social concerns and structures. So first and foremost, when a litter of pups are born, the puppies, these little, I couldn't mm-hmm. even imagine. I want to gobble you up. You're so cute. Uh, African wild dog puppies. They take priority over the alphas. Boom, done. It, I can kind of relate being a mama. You know, Xander, Zach, the minute they came out the door, it was like, okay, you win. Yeah, absolutely. Everything absolutely. else is second yep. class citizens. Yep. Uh, so it does make, but it's also, that's an important sign of intelligence and also realizing how critical this little pup is to passing on your genes. So they also exhibit cooperative care for their young. So what that means is these young cubs are raised by all members of the pack, including both males and females. Super cool. Mm -hmm. And when pups are, of course, they nurse from their mom. We'll talk a little bit about that and repro and the ages, which that happens. But when they do start eating solid meat, uh, both males and females will regurgitate fresh meat from a hunt to feed them and get them used to it and keep help them build up the fat and the nutrients that they need to grow and develop into strong little uh, painted dog pups, which might be one of the cutest things ever. And once they're old enough, the adults will take the little pups so cooperatively. So not just mom, not just dad, aunties, brothers, sisters, whatever, will take these pups to the kill Okay, so mm-hmm. they. I just. This is my visual. Mm-hmm. Could you, okay, this. This is. It's like me taking Zachary. Okay, <laughs> precocious over Zachary, to yes. <laughs> a taco bar, <laughs> and I'm like, you eat first. Like I'm starving. I haven't eaten in, in four yeah. days, three days, whatever. We get to that taco bar, and I'm and and it's one thing for me as a mom. Of course, I would let Zach eat first. I wouldn't be happy about it. I would complain about it, and I would be eating half off of his plate. But this is like his second cousin and his great uncle or whoever who are also very hungry and have a higher nutrient demand saying, no, 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 little one, you go ahead and eat before me. Even though I might not have another meal for who knows when. No, it's amazing. That's caretaking. Nuts, That's amazing right? caretaking. Yeah. Amazing caretaking. So anyway, so, so super um, dads the little ones get and super uncles, super dads, super, super brothers, super uncles, super pack. Yes, super pack. There you super go. Pack. There you go. There you go. Super moms for sure. Uh, you know, you can call me a a, a, a painted dog <laughs> mom any day of the week. I'll take that as a compliment, <laughs> yes. right? I'll even throw up my food for you. Yeah. Uh, um, and then when all this goes on, there's almost no fighting. Mm-hmm. You've probably have that one uncle yeah. do some squabbling. <laughs> yeah. We all have that one uncle, right? Uh, but overall, yeah. So, okay. So we've got that for the feeding. The other thing that's so incredible that's been documented time and time again in the wild is they have cooperative care for wounded or sick pack members. What? They don't do that for zebras. If you're an old yeah, zebra, you just kind of go off it's, into the. But this is that story. It's it, like right? how to escape a bear, just be faster than someone with you. You know, that's the zebra right, right, strategy. Right, right, totally. So no, with uh, uh with um African painted dogs, cooperative caring for wounded or sick pack members. So when a dog becomes ill or injured, or old, mm-hmm, right, that mm-hmm. happens unfortunately. So when a dog becomes sick or injured or just straight up old, the rest of the pack will help care for them and feed them. And in one article I read, there was recently an alpha female in Botswana that lost one of her four legs during a hunt. Mm. Poor dear. For 
I mean, Chris, once again, if this happened to zebra, forget about it. But I would say if this happened to even most carnivores, yeah. forget yeah, about it, yeah. right? Death, death sentence. Nope. She remained the alpha female for a few years after this. She bred and raised pups and was looked after the whole time by the pack. Yeah. Oh, well, monogamous. You know, that's my I woman. I just got goosebumps. Yeah. If, you need, if you need a reason to care about these guys, seriously. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, it's. Uh, I we got to delve more and if you, into this. And if you want to learn, if you want to learn more about them, or if you want to buy me a early birthday present, there's a book called African Wild Dog Behavior Ecology and Conservation, where a lot of these fun facts were taken from from Scott Creel and Nancy Scott and Nancy Creel. Um, so, so like how a, much is that? It's, it's like get, a book guess, that you you know. It's a real book. I think you just authored. told me to get you a birthday present. So, how much is that book on Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be extended in the mail. It's not cheap. Oh, we need some Patreons, Chris. <laughs> no wonder it why. Not it's cheap. not like on her bug textbook. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll uh, go to the but, local library. But maybe, maybe, it. maybe um, Scott and Nancy Creel, maybe they have that answer for me of how they do this hunting stuff. We should actually reach out to them and uh, see if we can get one of them on. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to yeah. tell you that as a note because I found, yeah. I came across this book and I was like, ooh, Angie yeah. wants this okay. for sure. Okay. And when I talk in first person about myself, you know it's okay. real. Then we will, uh, we will make it happen. And so other than that, uh, Af- I think a really important thing to know about their conservation is that African wild dogs are not territorial animals. So if given their free will, they would be considered, they're nomads or wanderers. And they can travel up to 50 kilometers in a single day. So they have territories between 400 and 1,500 square kilometers. Yeah, so there you go. There you go. There's your answer why they're in trouble. Look at the territory, right? right? That's what they require. And they're Well, they don't really have a territory. No. They just well, you know what I mean? wander the, the area around. that they live yeah, in yeah. and and right. they're just it's not that's not available to them. It just no longer is available to them. Let's keep no. with the cool stuff. Okay. So <laughs> Yeah, um but I think it's important that we know this as research and now we're learning maybe they can live more in woodlands than we maybe originally thought. And so there's still there's still a lot of hope out there, and a lot of a lot of people working towards figuring out how to help these guys. Uh, but they do communicate. What we do know about them is the way they communicate, obviously through vocalizations, as as Chris had previously suggested, but also through movements and touch, of course. And we have to keep in mind that this communication is key uh, for their social structure. Anybody who has ever tried to be part of a team or a marriage or a family, we all know that communication is the glue that holds us together, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the better you are at communicating, the more successful you'll be in a team. And so how all that irons out and how they do it when they're, especially when they're hunting, I understand dog dynamics. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to get into all the different behaviors that they would do in a pack as far as submissive behaviors, aggressive right, behaviors yeah, and yeah. play behaviors. And they're just, they're fun to watch. Yeah. Holy. And anybody who's ever watched pack behavior on any of the nature shows or uh, some of the stuff Chris will post on our show notes is just incredible. And, um, well, as, as Chris and I progress forward in the pod and, or as we get more experts on the podcast, we can maybe go into that a little bit more detail because for all the African wild dog fans out there, I, I'm not able to do their behavior justice. Trust me. That's why I want Chris to buy me. I mean, somebody, I mean, whoever to buy me that. <laughs> Got it. For Got my it. Birthday. Yes. Okay. okay. In July. Yeah. All right. That's no, good. Yeah. Um, and then just briefly, once again, we talked about that alpha male and female. They're going to be the dominant breeding pair. And, They're usually, and this is something to keep in mind for their conservation as well, is these guys are typically the only pair of pack members that mate. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about a pack of 7, 12, 15, 40 animals, that's not a super high succession rate as far as as how many animals, you know, if you look at a typical zebra herd, there's tons of females that are giving birth. Uh, and so what ends up happening is the dominant pair prevents the subordinates, the betas, however you want to call them, from breeding. And this breeding suppression in females sometimes can result in aggressive interactions. Uh, and once in a while, you've got that, you've got that 
loosey goosey female subordinate that is able to once in a while mate and rear young, but it's not, it's not super frequent. And the other thing to keep in mind about wild dog reproduction is that females aren't going to reach sexual maturity until they're 12 to 18 months, but the earliest recorded uh, reproduction of a female was just shy of two years. So it's typically when they're older, right? Um, and so that doesn't help their uh, life cycle, their generation cycle, if you will. But when a female isn't uh, impregnated by a male, gestation is really about 10 weeks um, because of delayed implantation. We've talked a little bit about that. And, and so when uh, an alpha male and female do get together, the pups are going to be born in March to July. That's going to be their birthing season. And litter sizes can be as small as two pups or 20. I don't know. 20 seems a little excessive, I, I, but I don't think they're typically that big. Yeah, that's huge. And, and yes. And so, of course, the pups are going to remain in a den with their mom for three to four weeks. And then once they come out and then as they get a little bit older and come out of their den, the adults are going to bring them regurgitated food and then they're going to take them to the sites. And so pups will remain in the den with their mama for about three to four weeks. I love that. I love that mama baby bonding time. But once they start to get a taste for solid foods, of course, any adult will bring them regurgitated food to help get them strong. These pups are cooperatively cared for by all the adults in the pack, which is just, once again, really incredible and really selfless mm -hmm. of a lot of the other pack members. And a typical litter uh, interval, so is going to be anywhere from 12 to 14 months. So uh, not super high turnover rate. Not uh, uh, So that's something to consider too when we think about how we get, how we grow this population. Yeah. And again, they're, you know, we talked about they're endangered. 1,400 breeding pairs left. There are 39 distinct populations, you know, throughout Africa. And again, human wildlife conflict is the number one problem. Habitat fragmentation is their their number one driver of them towards extinction. Now, reintroductions, Angie opened up the podcast talking about this. They are doing it throughout Africa, but they're not easy, especially predators. I mean, they, in 1980, in the, the KwaZulu natal province, they reintroduced them there. In 1998, there was only 12 dogs in three groups still there. So they, they weren't thriving. In 1995, this is all South Africa, by the way, the Matakui Game Reserve, it grew to 24 animals. They were doing okay. And then they had a rabies outbreak and knocked them all down to three. So, you know, it's a dual strategy. It's not only reintroducing these animals. It's we've got to preserve what's left. We have to preserve what wild le is left, period. Like not just in Africa, but here in North America, South America, Asia, throughout the world. So, you know, and there and we do have success stories in reintroductions, you know, Przewalski horse, black-footed ferret, California condor, blah, 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 blah. We've done it. And we can do it, and we're going to do it. So the big question is, who's doing this work? Who should we support? First, I want to give a shout out to my alma mater, Lincoln Park Zoo. They've done amazing work over in Africa to help vaccinate domestic dogs. As you had talked, and a, and, a, and a couple other organizations are doing this as well, um, but as you had mentioned earlier in the podcast, these the wild dogs are really susceptible to domestic dog diseases. And if dogs, whether they're domestic dogs or unwanted dogs in Africa, if they're not vaccinated, the different diseases such as rabies and distemper and things like that can travel from the domestic dogs into the wild dog population. And so there's been some successful campaigns to help vaccinate domestic dogs against rabies and some of these other diseases in order to promote the health of these local dogs, but even more importantly, help potentially prevent these really, really vulnerable fragmented populations of African wild dogs. And a big shout out to the organizations like Lincoln Park Zoo that are doing work overseas to help African wild dogs. And the other organization I really want to turn your attention to this week is the African Wildlife Foundation, www.awf.org. There you can find them on Facebook, 
Um, you can tweet about them and they have a gorgeous uh, website once again at www.awf.org. They are working very hard out in the field to protect wild dogs. As we talked about, wild dogs are losing their habitat and there's a lot of human conflict um, that's not helping them. And so they have several solutions to try to mitigate some of these issues. First and foremost, they try to look, educate communities on helping protect these um, these animals and giving them the equipment to basically do that um, by having scouts that can monitor animal behavior and movement and also by providing employment to the different parks and reserves and in order to help basically weave together conservation and economic opportunity that will help incentivize wild dog protection. And then the African Wildlife Foundation also works really hard to mitigate human wildlife conflict. And that's one of the, one of the bigger issues too with African wild dogs. And so they work to help community, help communities figure out different livestock enclosures that will help livestock, help their livestock from predators, not just wild dogs, but um, lions and things like that. And then they also work to, to basically monitor the wild dogs in their movement so they can um, as an entity, they can help prevent some of this conflict before it even happens. So check out African Wildlife Foundation. They have a beautiful website. Uh, they work with a lot of different species, but I was really pleased to see the great work uh, that they've been doing for the African wild dog in particular. So check them out. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And check out the links on the website. So conservation tip this week, Angie, besides vaccinating your pets, which everybody should do. Thank you for reminding us to do that. Um, this one I kind of came up and I never really thought about it. Keep fresh water outside for birds and wildlife. It was a good conservation tip because, you know, obviously all animals need water, fresh water. And if you have bird baths, fountains, or ponds, you know, in shady areas of your backyard, that's actually a good place for wildlife to come and get some water, especially in urban or suburban areas. It's really hard for wildlife to find fresh, fresh water. Now I will say, we will not put one in our backyard because our cat will go and collect birds, which is not what we want. But if you have a backyard free of cats, <laughs> you know, hopefully, or put it somewhere where the birds can get to it, you know, they really need uh, some water with that. All right. The question was, can African wild dogs breed with domestic dogs and produce a hybrid? What say you? Well, you said they have the same number of chromosomes. 78, yeah. 39 pairs, 78. For all, from what I know about some of that chromosome matching, I would hypothesize, yes. Yes, and you're wrong. <laughs> Ooh. You're wrong. Ding, ding, ding. They cannot. Uh, well, teach I, me. I don't mind being think. wrong as long as I you learn. Would think, no, no, you would think. You would think. I would have thought too. Same number of chromosomes. They're from the same family, but different genus. So genetically, they are different. And so those chromosomes don't ever match up and produce a viable offspring. Interesting. That first cool. of all, okay, first of all, after your, your talk about behavior, their African wild dogs cannot be domesticated. They just, they, they have innate behaviors that are just too wild. Can't happen. Genetically, they're not like a wolf. Like here's another one, Ethiopian wolf. You've wanted to do this one. You know, they have from the genus Canis. Now, they can breed with domestic dogs because Canis lupus familiaris. But because of African wild dogs being a different genus, being much further separated along the evolutionary tree, they cannot produce hybrids. So there you go. I was, it was, it was, I was surprised. That's awesome. I, I like, mean, wow. yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks for teaching us, Science. Chris. Science. <laughs> well, you taught us about behavior. Uh, Their behavior so is much incredible. more I learn. I couldn't even do it justice, but. We are. That's we why will, we have to we save them so we can animal. learn more about how they yes. do this. This is incredible. Yes. I am going to make it my mission, or you, you know, I'm going to push Angie to make it her mission. We will find an African wild dog specialist. We will. And we will interview them within the next few months. We will set that up because these animals are just too amazing. I can't believe we waited this long to cover them. Thank you for the recommendations out there. We love, love you guys. Them. I love them. A, we I love them. African dogs. Yeah. And B, we love yes. you. So yes, therefore we do yes. love African wild dogs yes. more than you, but not by much. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, all we can ask is check us out on Patreon. Check out our webpage, www.allcreaturespod.com. Send this podcast to a friend. We need to keep growing. For those of you that are doing it, thank you. And if you you can't do Patreon and your mom can, send it to your mom. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. (laughs) And then she can send you the free episodes. Shout out to my my good friend, Joe. You know, he's supporting us. Uh, Wonderful artist. Great friend. So anyways, check us out. Thank you. Next week, another species. We're just going to keep rolling. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Listen. Learn. Share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.